has been in the news all this week for different reasons, but we love having him on here, as he's always got his ear to the ground and quick to tell us the issues real people care about, as opposed to the Prime Minister's Canberra bubble. Joining me now to discuss the biggest issues of the day is radio broadcasting giant for 2GB and 4BC, Chris Smith. Mate, I tell you what, I'm very happy to have you before you take yourself off seas to warmer climates uh, on a wonderful cruise for some time. But uh, we'll get into the, the political issues, but you've made yourself a... Well, I don't think you've made yourself a bit of an issue. You have been a bit of a headline issue. Things going to be sorted out? Because I know you have a very loyal brigade of listeners out there on radio. Yeah, well, I've got 100 to take on this cruise in about two days' time, so we get on fairly well. And, you know, I have got a great love affair with my listeners. It's been 18 years, and when you spend um, emotional, um, some controversial and heated moments with your listeners so close in their homes, in their, in their dining rooms, wherever, for 18 years, um, you have a bond that really is tough to break. Let's hope we don't have to break it. Um, let's hope the discussions behind the scenes sort themselves out, and I really hope that they sort themselves out sooner rather than later. But I tell you what, some of the support I've had in the last um, week and a half has been humbling, Peter, so it's been great. Oh, well, Alan prevailed. I'm sure you will too, Chris Smith. I wanted to get into some other issues. Um, today is the 1st of July. It's a new financial year, in, a, in addition to being, obviously, the start of a new parliamentary term. A whole lot of government changes are coming through. I'll put some of them on the screen for people at home. Um, government made some comments last year, some policy changes in relation to a cap on migration. The new cap starts from 1 July. It's 160,000 people, as opposed to previous years, where it's been 183. There's some changes in terms of tax. Part of uh, the tranche that the government would like to get through the parliament. Uh, there's some changes about uh, a default marker offer on energy, which is a whole lot of blah blah but it's supposedly going to bring down power prices, but not if you listen to some of the callers on radio I listen to today. Uh, changes in superannuation and uh, rebates for GP services, a number of them will increase. This is all about the government's attempts to deal with cost of uh, living issues, Chris. It's really biting, and I tell you, I listened to callers right around the country in the last few weeks. It's got colder here in the middle of winter, right around the country. And power prices are the real worry and people are just not prepared to turn their heating on in a country as rich as ours. And we've got people in emergency departments, and I mean professionals, saying that they have to deal with elderly people who come to them with hypothermia in their own bedrooms, in their own lounge rooms. That is how bad it's got. And Correct. Craig Kelly told the bill on this about eight months ago and he said it would happen, and it has. And they've been inundated in some of, the, in some of these emergency rooms and it's... It's just despicable that we've got to that. Now, the government doesn't have much time to make a difference. I heard a lot of callers today saying, well, that's fine, yeah, I've had $50 off my bill because I asked them to get a better charge on this. And when the Angus, Angus Taylor, the energy minister, comes out and tries to explain it, as he did today, it is, as you say, blarty blark gobbledygook. No-one really understands it. So they've got limited time to make a difference. Bills have gone out of control, and it's about time the change is dug deep. Now, I like what they're doing with the ATO and multinationals, which is basically what uh, Bill Shorten campaigned heavily on during the election. That's a good thing. That's got to be taken up. That's got to also make a difference to the bottom line. But back on power bills, we've had enough. We've heard the gobbledygook about this and that. And I also heard today the same questions asked of Angus Taylor about can we not secure our energy future as well? So when Liddell closes down in two, two summers' time, we don't have blackouts in some of the big... You know, states like, like Victoria again and also New South Wales. And I got... And, again, it was sort of hedging his bets about, well, we've got one in the offing in Queensland and we're thinking about that. There are people who want to build these things from China, even local support as well. Why aren't we doing something to secure our energy into the future? We're not doing enough. Yeah, look, this is the real lesson, regardless of which side of politics you're on. Out of the Victorian election, Daniel Andrews said, I will fix that roundabout at the end of your street. I will fix that railway crossing that you cross every day and you're worried about your kids on their bikes uh, after school crossing as well. And they were fixed. People are looking for tangible commitments 
uh, being demonstrated before they go to vote at the next election. I think, I think people are willing the government to succeed around this building today. It certainly feels like it's actually a new government and not the continuation of a government elected in 2013. It feels like a new government, but they've got to start to deliver. That's the real challenge. Um, another issue that, that is in the mix of things today, Labor has announced it will wave through or let go through uh, the government's full package of tax reform in the lower house. But they're not committing to, to backing in the whole tranche in the upper house. There's three components to it. They don't want to support the higher end changes. Now, I have to say, as a political tactician, if they don't put up or get through all three parts of it, there is no way any, any political party will go to an election just trying to finish off the tax cuts for rich people if they've done the middle income and they've done the lower income. So if it's ever going to happen, they have to, the, the Liberal Party has to try and keep them all together. The challenge will be that Labor won't support that, so it'll come down to the crossbench. Well, interestingly today, some in the crossbench, particularly out of South Australia, are looking at this issue of supporting the government's tax reform based on whether Scott Morrison will do something about an alleged breach of ministerial standards by Christopher Pine, a former defence minister who, within a nanosecond of leaving parliament, is earning a big ticket income, quote unquote, consulting back on defence issues. These two issues, Chris Smith, are getting locked in together. I hate when crossbench senators do this. I hate when they say, oh, we won't be a House of Review anymore. We'll actually put up our own policy so that if you want your policy to get through, we've got to do some trading. That's not the way the public want the Senate to act. They want it to be a House of Review. They don't want those same crossbench senators to start dictating to the rest of both houses on what they think are their wheelbarrows. End of it. F finish it. And if, those, if there's anything about winning an election that gives you a mandate, Surely what Scott Morrison has said to the electorate during the campaign is enough for Labor to go ahead and say, we lost, you won, the public wanted these tax cuts to go through, get over with it and get on with it. But there's Christopher Pine. Peter, he loves being involved in controversy and there he is. He won't be called to any Senate inquiry. He doesn't have to. It's just a, a little bit of a body blow again for Scott Morrison. But he's off into the sunset. We saw this a little bit with Bob Carr when he left as New South Wales Premier and we saw it, of course, with Andrew Robb. The public don't like it because it, it feels, it smells sus. Now, there's probably nothing wrong with what they're doing. Certainly under the law, there's nothing wrong. But you don't know what they did whilst they were in government, the decisions they were making as ministers, as, uh, as premiers, to try and ingratiate themselves with that oh, sector Chris, of their portfolio. Chris, I have to... Oh, Can we I not have, have a moratorium of a year between when they leave parliament and when they take up these consultancies? Well, this, well, let's look. I'll put it up on the screen. The Ministerial Code of Standards are very, very clear. It's an 18-month stand-down. You can't lobby, quote, you can't lobby, you can't advocate or have business meetings with a member of the government, parliament, public service or defence force on any matter with which you've had official dealings with as a minister. Now, that knocks out Christopher Pine touching anything in defence yeah. or defence industries, in my view. And I could have made myself hundreds of thousands of dollars as a chief of staff to a prime minister walking out the door uh, of, of a political office and signing myself to industry. Uh, ministers are bound by laws like this. Senior staff are bound by rules like this. I think it's absolutely fair enough. I think it stinks to high heaven. Yeah. And I think more strength to the Senate's arm. The thing is, what can they do about it? Taxpayers, I have to say, are paying Christopher Pine, or, or he will get once he hits retirement age, a very, very big whack of superannuation. He's on the old scheme, the defined benefits scheme. And this is where I think Scott Morrison and his integrity as PM will be watched very closely as to what he will do about this, Chris. Well, what can he do? At the end of the day, what can he do? And Christopher Pod, you know what, what he's like. You know better than any of us what he's like. He'd be giggling away with that stupid giggle about how he's got away with this and about how he can go to Ernst & Young and be their, their, their great consultant. And there hasn't been enough separation. And the public just, OK, I don't care whether he's breached the rule technically or not. The public don't buy it, they don't like it, and it smells. Right, what about Julie Bishop and she's got a media career? What about that? It, all, it was always going to happen. It had to be something related to publicity, red carpet, a chance to wear that, those great dresses that she's always worn. Look, imagine the international leaders and the contact book that she would have and those that could come on and sit down, you know, 
or should I say Barbara Bishop style, and uh, sit down and uh, talk to her about international matters. I don't know, you know, what sort of wide appeal it'll have because the Australian accent, you know, doesn't quite work abroad. But why not, you know, if that's where she wants to go, good on her. Yeah, look, and I don't think she's breached the ministerial code, which is the only test uh, that there should be. Whether people turn on, that's up to them to make their own uh, decisions. But she's not hawking herself around as some of the others have left Parliament are. Um, just quickly, what did you make yesterday of the meeting in North Korea with President Trump? I have to say, when he put it out there on social media to say to Kim Jong-un, I'm around, I might pop in for a cup of tea, I could just imagine the calamity behind the scenes from his officials and others. I um, mean, he is an unpredictable president, but George Orr is better than World War, they say, and maybe having an open dialogue uh, with a despot is better than the alternative. And he's copped it again. I'm still seeing, you know, left-wing um, podcasts talking about how dangerous it is and this is not the way to go about diplomatic relations and things like that. They should be thankful that we don't have a situation where there's war threatened with the axis of evil. And that's what George W. Bush called uh, North Korea, the axis of evil. Now, I'm still a little bit sus about whether that's a drone or some sort of UFO heading over the DMC tonight. But anyway, we'll put that aside. It could be Kim Jong-un. Um, I don't know. But look, there he was. He's, a, he's an amazing negotiator, Donald Trump. And there he is. He comes in as a tiger and goes so hard, you think he's just taken the world to the brink of war. And then all of a sudden, he turns into a pussycat and then he meets somewhere in between, even turning up for a cup of tea. Whether you love, love him, whether you hate him, you've got to appreciate the fact that we've now extinguished those uh, toxic tensions between the United States and North Korea. Yeah, well, I want to see something come of it, but I do think it's better to be in the position where they can at least meet, sit yeah. down together in a room, and the officials then can follow through. Let's hope something comes of it. Hey, now, just quickly, where's this cruise to? Oh, it's, it's a transatlantic cruise between... It's hard work, you know. It's a transatlantic cruise oh, from, <laughs> from New York that goes to London. So we spend a, a week, I think, a, a little bit of... A, less than a week in New York, then on the QM2 over to London for six days, a little bit of time in London, on the Channel, over to Paris, and then heading home absolutely exhausted and in need of a holiday. Hey, and 100 listeners. Well, you have a wonderful time. I'm a bit of a cruise fan myself. I only got into it a couple of years ago with my mum. It's great. But I'm totally converted to the cruising life. Yeah. Chris Smith, thanks very much for your time. Good on you. Good, Good to be here.